Okay, so tonight will be Parashat Yitro, the last parasha that we're doing in this series that we began a little over a year ago. Even though there are other series on the parasha that have been already uploaded, this one is unique because it's more about the emphasis on the valuable lessons in the parasha. And Parashat Yitro is very significant because of the many, many lessons contained in the transmission of the Torah to future generations. God willing, after we complete the series, what uh, I'll be doing is uh, perhaps giving over some insights into the parasha in Spanish, for those who are interested, in Hebrew. But in English, this will be the last parasha. There's, of course, already a, a lot of information in the parasha that has been uploaded. Parasha Kitro is known, very well known, because of Kabbalat Torah. This is the parasha when the Jewish people receive the Torah. Ultimately, this is why they went out of Egypt. They went out of Egypt to become a nation, a nation that will commit itself to follow a certain unique path, path of the Torah. They don't get the Torah right away, only after 50 days. Little by little, they're departing Egypt, not only physically, getting away from it, but also spiritually, they need to grow. They need to grow and detach themselves from the mentality that they've had for so long, being slaves in Egypt. One thing that was accomplished, however, in Egypt, was that perhaps they became more accustomed to servitude. Hopefully, they're humbler. Hopefully, they're ready to accept the yoke, the yoke of heaven, not the yoke of Pharaoh. This obviously is not such a simple matter, because in order to accept properly the yoke of heaven, one has to be holy, one has to be pure, one has to be more than just willing. He has to have some clarity as to what is involved. Why? Because it's not easy. No, not easy at all. Believe me, it's easier to build a pyramid in all that hard labor than it is to observe the mitzvot properly. And the reason why I say that is because it's not just about observing. One can observe. That's easy. Torah is about growth. It's about spiritual growth. It's about connecting to the Almighty. It's a whole different type of experience. When we talk about people being alive, we're talking about many people who exist. They're not really alive. To be alive is really a whole different idea. Judaism talks about what it means to be alive. Not just to exist, to eat, drink, work. No, this is not just about existence. This is about life. What Hashem intended from the very, very beginning, what He would want this world to be like. So we get a little bit of a glimpse by learning the Torah, what exactly Hashem has in mind. Even though Parashat Yitro does not discuss the entire Torah, it does discuss the Ten Commandments, the Serta Dibrot. And we will see some very important ideas that are communicated to us in the Serta Dibrot. But what exactly happens in Kabbalat Torah? When we receive the Torah, what is pretty much happening is a wedding. This is a wedding, Hatuna. This is the marriage between Hashem and the Jewish people. And the Torah represents the ketuva, it represents the contract, the marriage contract. And what's contained in this particular marriage contract? Hashem's duties to us, what He promised us, His covenant with us, and our responsibilities as well. You know, in a regular marriage contract between husband and wife, you basically see what the husband is promising to do for his wife. What the wife will do for the husband is understood, hopefully. Man's obligation is a lot more involved in what he takes upon himself to take care of his wife. A man has tremendous responsibilities to take care of his wife and eventually the children. And it's not a simple responsibility. He's actually committing himself that if he has to, he'll even take off the shirt off his back sell it in order to provide for his family. The Torah is not only about this contract, however, 
the Torah is also about the survival of the Jewish people as a nation, both physically and spiritually. So this is serious. It's a serious relationship. It's a serious contract. However, if you look at history, and we have a lot of history that we can look back at, we will see, unfortunately, that the Jewish people were not always so good about keeping their side of the contract. But interestingly, Hashem did keep His part. You know, it was even though we went into exile, even though we were punished, Hashem never abandoned us, He never divorced us. And the prophets make it very clear, because a lot of people don't think like that. They really think that Hashem left us and replaced us with other nations. That's not true. The prophets are very clear that as far as Hashem is concerned, even though He's unhappy, and we can see it, he has never abandoned us. He made a promise to us. He made a promise to our forefathers, and he has been keeping it till now. And it's obvious. Today you can see many of those prophecies being fulfilled. We're heading back to Eretz Yisrael, and very soon Mashiach is going to come. The Bet Hamikdash, the Temple, will be rebuilt. All of that is happening, as we we can see. We can actually see a lot of that unfold before our eyes. And this Torah, however, is important for another reason. The Torah is also a manual of instructions, just like we have manual of instructions on how to operate a very sophisticated piece of equipment. You want to operate it properly, you want to know how to use it, you should read the manual of instructions. So the Torah represents the manual of instructions on how a Jew should live his life, how to live successfully, how to accomplish the goal that was intended for us as a nation to accomplish. What most people forget, however, is that it's not only the manual of instruction, it's also a tavlin kenege de yetzerara. The rabbis remind us that this Torah, don't just think of it as a manual of instruction, which it is, but it also has a very powerful component. If you learn it in the right way, for the sake of heaven especially, then it will act as an antidote against the evil inclination. We have an evil inclination, we have a yetzera, we have weaknesses. In order to overcome them, we need help. It's not easy. It's a big struggle against the evil inclination. We all have our weaknesses. The Torah helps. The Torah, if it's learned properly, can act as an antidote, as a tavlin against this yetzera. It can give us the strength that we need to do battle with the yetzera. By following the Torah, Observing the mitzvot, the commandments, we will also have this world, we will be blessed in this world, and we will gain our ticket to Olam Abba, to the world to come. So, so much is accomplished by connecting with this Torah. Now, in order to assure that this important Torah, this contract, is properly transmitted to future generations, because remember, that first generation was very excited and looked forward to receiving it. They said, Nasevenishma, yes, we will do, we will follow, we will hear everything you have to say, Moshe. That was not always the case with every generation. Today, unfortunately, many, many Jews are not observant. They're totally ignorant, deprived of their heritage. So what does the Torah do, initially at least, to somewhat guarantee that this Torah will last? that it would not be, be interrupted, that it should continuously be taught generation after generation. After all, we need to keep by this mitzvot. We need to follow it for, for all times. So what will need to be done in order for that transmission to be there all the time? So we find various emphasis. Emphasis number one, the Torah pretty much stresses the importance of chinuch ha'iladim, education of the children, make sure that they go to good, good schools, they have the best teachers. A lot of people, unfortunately, spend more on their car than on Jewish education. They don't realize how important it is. You want your kid to have the best education possible, Jewish education? You gotta invest, even if it costs money. So that is number one. The children are the future. Make sure you invest in them. Number two, there is also an emphasis in the Torah, as well as in the Talmud, about being respectful to the Chachamim, the teachers of the Torah, the ones who are 
basically entrusted with teaching, transmitting this Torah to the masses. If we don't respect them, then we're not going to respect their teachings either. Then you will find something very interesting. You will also find an emphasis on the precision or accuracy of what is written in the Torah. One letter that is missing, it invalidates the entire Torah. You can't read from it in the synagogue. And it happens from time to time. I mean, a scribe, as proficient as he is in writing that Torah, he may have the most beautiful handwriting, but he has to be careful that he doesn't miss anything or add an extra letter or change something. And this was done over the years. They were very, very strict. Why so strict? Because that's the nature of texts, that with time, there is all kinds of misprints and all kinds of omissions mistakes. Hey, we can't afford that. It has to be accurate. So you want the transmission to be accurate, you have to be careful with all of this. Especially considering that there's a lot of kohot chitzonim, there's a lot of forces out there, a lot of things that will attempt to discourage us, to take us away from the Torah, all kinds of toxic, I call them, toxic elements that are dangerous to the Jew, spiritually dangerous. So this is a fact that we are all aware of. We're unfortunately very familiar with the many, many things that can interfere in our life. Jews were threatened in all kinds of ways. This has never gone away. This has always been a challenge. And therefore, we have to be careful with all kinds of potential threats that can take away a Jew, disconnect him from that Torah, from that tradition. I'm going to give you now an example of a powerful connection between a father and son that Baruch Hashem is healthy, strong, and therefore productive. And we will see from the following story the opposite. In other words, not such a strong connection. It's a story that happened, I don't know, many years ago on a flight from Israel to the United States or from the United States to Israel, I forget. A rabbi and his son sat down next to a secular Jew. Now this secular Jew happened to be a professor. So he was an intellectual. He was somewhat familiar with Judaism, but he was secular. I don't think he believed in God. But, as you know, nothing happens by chance. The fact that they sat next to each other, perhaps, was meant to be for good reason. During the flight, it's a long flight, the professor noticed how the rabbi's son was so respectful of his father. He brought him a drink. If his dad needed something, he went to get it. He took care of all, whatever it is that the father needed. He spoke to him very respectful. He made a very, very positive impression on the professor. So after noticing this for a long time, the professor asked the rabbi, can I ask you a question? She says, sure. Tell me, I don't understand how come it is by you, religious Jews, your kids are so respectful of the father, of the mother, they're very respectful of their parents. And by us, no. My son tells me what to do. I have to be the one that helps my son. I have to do everything for him. He doesn't do anything for me. Nothing close to what your son did for you. Can you tell me what the difference is? Rabbi says, I think I can tell you the difference, sure. You see, by us, the further we go back in time, the closer our forefathers were to Sinai. They were therefore closer to the truth, closer to the giving of the Torah. We therefore have tremendous respect for the generations before us because they were so much holier and closer to the, to the origin of the Torah, to the giving of the Torah. So therefore, we look up to those who came before us, realizing that they're better than us, they're holier than us. By you, however, it's just the opposite. The more you go back in time, the more primitive you believe man was, up to the point when man was a monkey. 
So therefore, it's only normal that the son should think of himself as more advanced than his daddy. Because according to your son, the way he sees life, the way you've taught him, is that you are more primitive than him. And he is more advanced. And therefore, you have to be more respectful of him and not the other way around. It's cute, but it's also in some ways very, very true. We give tremendous respect to those who are before us, not only because they deserve the respect, because we realize that the transmission, the proper transmission of Torah really depends on this. Now, even though I just said that the previous generation was very important to observant Jews, they always looked up to them, and as a result of that, the transmission was strong. It's still true that there's something called Yeridat Adorot. Despite it all, the generations have become weaker, spiritually lower in comparison to the past, no comparison whatsoever. Just go back 30 years even. Spiritually, people were very, very different in many, many ways. So, despite it all, there is something called Yeridat Adorot. Generations have become weaker and weaker as we get closer to the end of days. One of the ways that we see that the generations have become weaker is what the rabbis tell us in the Gemara. One of the signs that you're living in the Messianic era, chutzpah tizgeh. There will be an increase in chutzpah. You know what chutzpah is? Poru in Farsi. I think so. That would be the best translation. Impudence. All kinds of words to describe, but you know what I mean. Wow. Why? What, what's all this chutzpah doing here? Now, what does chutzpah really mean? In a family, it means that the child will, will be respect, disrespectful of his dad. He will speak against him. He won't speak in a respectful way to him. He won't look up to him. The Gemara describes that this will be something that you can easily see, where in the past, you all remember how the child would kiss his parents' hand how he did not dare speak in a very disrespectful way. Some kids even trembled when the, when the father was in the room. I mean, whether it was the father or the teacher, it was a whole different type of generation. Today, the, the kid will tell the, the teacher, I'll sue you. I'll call the police on you. This is just a small example. And on their parents as well, they've done that. Wow. Once you see this phenomena, once you see the disrespect from the child to the parent, then you understand why and how there's been a gradual disconnect or detachment from the tradition. Because if you don't respect your parents, you're not going to respect their tradition. And it works the other way around too. If you don't respect the tradition, then you're going to lose respect for your father because he follows that tradition. Little by little, generation after generation, that respect is lost. The generation that comes next will therefore have less of an attachment to what was considered so holy and special in the past that they were willing to sacrifice to give their life for it. How come in the past they were willing to do that and now? No, not as much. Little by little, they cooled off, they got away, and a lot of it has to do with the disconnect between the children and the parents. Whenever you see all this chutzpah and lack of shame, you should know that this is also an indication that the Yerat Shammai, the fear of heaven, is very, very low. One who's really God-fearing does not show that kind of chutzpah. Not, definitely not to his tradition. It's a, it's a contradiction. So you should know, whenever you see that chutzpah in people, people acting in such a disrespectful way, regardless to whom they act that way, it shows that the Yerat Shammai, the barometer of fear of heaven, is very, very low. So whenever you see Yerat Shammai very low, automatically what that produces is an increase in those very lowly types of midot, of characteristic, whether it's lack of shame or chutzpah, and so forth. The Rashi goes down, automatically what happens is an increase in all of those very not nice characteristics. All right, since we said that 
the transmission is very much dependent on being respectful of one's parents, what does Hashem do? He puts that one mitzvah of honoring one's parents, kibbut avayim, in the aseret that he brought, in the Ten Commandments. Remember, we have 613. Ten is a small list. And what goes in that small list? For some reason, Hashem chose, I'm going to put, honor your parents. Does it have to be one of the ten? Yes. If that transmission is so important, we cannot afford a lack of respect for the previous generation? Oh no. It's going to be in the Ten Commandments. That's how important it is. And what's in the Ten Commandments? How one needs to be respectful of Hashem. Right? Hashem there's no one else. Right next to that, you have the mitzvah of honoring one's parents. Because if you lose this one, you're going to lose that one. If you honor your parents, you really show respect to the previous generation and to your tradition, then the chances are that you're going to hopefully be respectful of God too. But if you're not going to be respectful of your parents and of your tradition, then shortly after, you're going to lose respect for Him too. That's why the two are close to each other in the Ten Commandments. What's interesting about this is not just that it's important to respect our parents, to respect God, but who a person respects in life, who he values, tells us a lot about him too. Who does he look up to? Who does he admire? Take, for example, kids. It's very, very common to see kids admiring basketball players, especially certain children who are into basketball. They're not so much into their learning. Eh, they love sports or whatever. They will even hang pictures of their favorite players in their bedrooms doesn't have to be basketball, whatever sport they're into. They admire it. They look up to him. They're probably dreaming of maybe being one day like them. Now take somebody who, instead of having basketball players in his room, pictures of them, instead he has pictures of tzaddikim, of righteous people, of great rabbis, holy men. It says a lot about this child, or about the couple, about this home. Look who they look up to, look at whom they admire. This is the people who they want to be like. This is the ones that they admire. And that is really the meaning of the Pasuk. Your eyes should always constantly observe your teachers, the past, the, the great people of the past, the ones who taught you, the ones who guided you. Looking at the previous generation, therefore, has always been of great importance to the Jew because what's been taught to us is that this is what we should strive to be like. As the rabbis tell us, a person, a Jew, should always ask himself, when will I be like my forefathers? When will my deeds come close to being like my forefathers? In other words, one has to strive, one has to aspire to be like them. If you're never going to want to be like them, then it's never going to happen. If you strive, if you want it, then there's a chance you'll be. I mean, not everyone succeeds in being exactly what he planned on being or wanted to be, but at the very least, if he has this desire, it does a lot for him. And it says a lot about him. So this is what we were told. This is what you should look up to. This is whom you should strive to be like and learn from. And if you want pictures, these are the people that you should, whose pictures you could hang so that you can continuously remind yourself, so that your eyes can continuously look at this and hopefully you want this for yourself and for your children. And what is the goal, after all, in being like them? Because what we want to achieve in life is to be a God-fearing Jew. As Solomon says in his famous book, Kohelet Kekliastis, the last verse, pretty much, the last few verses, what's the bottom line of life? Kohelet says throughout his book, I've been teaching you, hopefully convincing you, that I call heaven avalim, everything is a bunch of vanities. You don't take it with you. You know, there was the money, the real estate. So what really counts? Sof davar akol nishmai taroim yeravet mitzvotav shemor kizekolam. He says, sof davar, the bottom line, in the end, what really matters is observe God's Torah. Be God-fearing. And observe his mitzvot. 
That's what matters. That's what really counts. That's what they will look at. That's what they will consider. And that we do take with us. So, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, who had everything you can imagine, says, nah, it's all vanities. What really counts and is important? To be a God-fearing person. To observe the mitzvot. Which means, of course, to be kind-hearted, to help people, to do everything that the Torah tells us to do. One who does not have Yerat Shammai, one who does not fear heaven, but he's learned it in Torah, that learning will not really do too much for him. You know that there have been a lot of learned people, very wise people, who fell spiritually. The Torah by itself, because their intention was never to strive for the truth, to be God-fearing. That was never the intention. They just wanted to be knowledgeable. Now the rabbis do tell us, okay, that's fine to begin to learn Torah that way, even though you don't have pure intentions, even though your goal is not yet to be God-fearing, okay, just get started. Get started. Hopefully by learning Torah, by learning a lot of it, you will see the beauty in it, and you will want to learn it for its real reasons, for its real sake, for the sake of heaven. You can't expect a child to understand the beauty, the value of the Torah, so tell them, just learn it. Get a good grade. You get a prize. That's how we do with children. So even with an adult, it's okay to start off with a simple kavanah, with a simple idea of just learn it, become familiar with it. But in the end, you have to know why you're learning it. What's the real reason? Because the reason will make a difference in what the Torah will do for us, whether it will mold us into being God-fearing or not. Okay, so now that we understand the importance of being a God-fearing Jew, look at Parashat Yitro, and you will find that there's an individual who is not even Jewish. He's the father-in-law of Moshe, Yitro. And he was a very interesting man. He was a very knowledgeable individual. He was originally an idolater. He was pagan. But he at least did research. He examined all the religions that he could in search for the truth. And he came to the conclusion that Judaism is the truth. And therefore, he decided to convert. All right. But that's not where it ends. Yitro was a good man, you should know. And he stuck around a little bit with his son, Allah Moshe. And he observed one day that Moshe was judging the people. People would come and consult with Moshe, ask questions, seeking the knowledge of the Torah. And he did this, Moshe, from the morning till the night. Moshe, you can't do this. You're going to collapse. This is not for one man to do. You've got to have other people. You got to delegate. You have to have other judges. That which is complex, let them bring to you. But the easier stuff, let them handle it. And Hashem agreed with what Yitro told Moshe. This is good advice. Remember, Yitro is experienced. He's an older man and he knows about these things. But it wasn't so much only this advice that he gave him, it's the qualifications that you're going to look for to appoint a judge. That's what's interesting. And what are those qualifications? Four, he says. Moshe, when you choose a judge, make sure that he is the following. He is an Chayil. An Chayil, the best translation that I would uh, suggest for that word Chayil is people who are strong in their character. You might find the translation of competent, capable, men of substance, all of these translations do not do justice to the word Chayil. Chayil really comes from strength. You need people who are strong in character so that they're not afraid of the litigants. You need people who have this inner strength so that they can control their desires and not succumb to the evil inclination. Virtuous people, I guess you could translate, but Chayil means strength, an inner, a special inner strength. You need people who are Yireh Lokim, God-fearing, of course. You need people who are in Sheimet, men of truth. Yes. And you need Sonei Batza, those who hate monetary gain, which means that you cannot, you cannot easily bribe them. They don't care about money. And they have enough of their own money, too, which helps. Now, this is not easy to find. Now, ask 
please do me a favor and ask Mr. Trump if he knows people like that in Congress who have all these qualifications. I don't think you'll find any. These are not simple qualifications. So my question is, how do you adopt these qualities? Because you're not born with them. That's a fact. You're not born with these things. You have to learn them somewhere. And there's no school that teaches these four. So let's think about, for example, Yer Elohim, to be God-fearing. I mean, how do you start? How do you develop that? Do you think that Moshe was like that in, in his youth? A lot of people are surprised when I share with them this Midrash. There's a Midrash. In other words, it's not written in the Torah, but it's, it's the writings that describe the oral Torah, some of the details that we don't have in the written Torah, supplementary information. So there's an interesting story about Moshe. There was once a king who heard about Moshe Rabbeinu. He heard that he was a great man, the leader of the Jewish people, a wise man, close to God, very special, highly qualified, unique in his character as well. So it was hard for him to set up a meeting with him, so he sent a painter. He had a very good painter who knew how to draw what a person looks like accurately. Today we have photographs, in those days they didn't have cameras. But there were some people who were very talented. So this king had a very talented painter. Please go to Moshe, make a painting of him, and bring it back to me. I want to see what he looks like. So he came, made a painting of Moshe, came back to the king. The king takes a look at this painting and says, this is Moshe. He looks like a cruel man to me. From what I see, from what you described, unless you made a mistake, he looks like he's cruel, not kind, humble, charitable, as they would have described him. I th something is wrong here. I have to figure this out. I have to go see Moshe myself. What I heard does not seem to, to be what I, what I see from the painting. So he finally gets a meeting with Moshe. And he says, Moshe, apparently my painter did a very good job. You look exactly the way you are in this painting. But tell me, my impression is that you are not so nice, you are cruel. You must have a temper too. Is that what they say about you? And Moshe says, King, with all due respect, let me tell you something. You are right. By nature, that's the way I am. But you know what? I control myself. I've worked on my character. I've worked on my midot to be humble. I wasn't born like that. Yes, the impression that you have is pretty correct. But what you don't know is that I've been working very, very much on myself. And what I have become is because of my work, not because that's my nature. The rabbis tell us that avodah la midot, working on one's character, is a very, very difficult, very difficult job that requires much effort. But one can do it. If one works on this steadily, one can definitely refine his character. So therefore, because refinement of character is so important, the first condition or the first qualification that Yitro pointed out was Anshe Chayil, those men of fortitude, of inner strength, that can control their Yetzirah, their evil inclination, those who are able to control themselves, that's a major achievement. That's a major achievement because in order for a man to complete himself, he has to be able to control his evil inclination. He has to have self-control. It's a tremendous power. Once one has been able to achieve that, that he can control himself. Because if he does, this will be the key to help him achieve all the other qualifications that I mentioned. So that's why Sheikh Chayil is number one, at least in the list. Inner strength, self-control. You should be able to be in control of the Yetzirah of the evil inclination. Okay, so how do we find these people? Yitro tells Moshe a very interesting word. He doesn't say the usual word for, look for these people, find them. Atat Hezeh. Atat Hezeh mekol am. The word Hezeh is very unique in Lashon HaKodesh in Hebrew. You rarely see it. 
Perhaps the translation of the Chizeh would be analyze, look deeply, investigate, research. It's not just look around, ask around, interview. No, it's much more than that. Look deeply into the character of people and make sure that they have these qualifications. And how is he going to do that? Is there a machine that can tell us if a person is a liar or saying the truth? You know, they, they use these machines today in the courts. Is there a real accurate machine that will tell us if somebody's got fearing, he hates money? <laughs> so the Zohar says, through your Ruach HaKodesh, you are divinely inspired. You should be able to figure this out. The Zohar also says, through palmistry, look at people in their hand, in the palm of the hand. I speak a little bit about palmistry in one of the lectures. It's an incredible, incredible knowledge base of information about the individual. If people would know it right, I guarantee you there's so much to learn about it, so much to learn from it, about not about just about the future, but about man's strengths and weaknesses. It could be very helpful in certain ways for people to know themselves, either through that or through astrology, so they can focus on realizing that they are destined to be certain individuals and they have to watch out for certain things and how they can be successful. So that's why palmistry, along with astrology to a certain extent, can be helpful tools. So the Zohar speaks about it. Palmistry is really powerful, much more than astrology because it's more accurate. It gives us a clearer picture of who this man is in front of us. Whereas in astrology, you see just tendencies and probabilities, but you don't actually see a real accurate map of what is happening before us, the difference between the left hand and the right hand, the potential, the raw nature, what has he been doing in refining that character, what will be with his efforts, will he succeed or not? So even though man has free will, and it's not possible for us to know what will be necessarily the future because things can change. However, if you were to know by reading the hands, if you were to know where this man is holding as far as worth, what his nature is like, you definitely can have a glimpse or some sort of a picture of where he's headed in life, whether he will end up in jail, God forbid, or divorcing his wife, or worse, you know, hurting himself because of not taking care of his physical body or his soul. A lot of that appears in the hand. Much of this can be seen in the hand. So Yitro tells Moshe, you want to know how to figure these things out? You have quite a few tools available to you to look into. But there's no argument that the key to being able to start working on Yerat Shemaim, the key is to have control over one's vices, over one's tavot and one's desires. That's the key. It depends, number one, on whether a person can gain the upper hand in controlling his vices. The reason for that, as the Kabbalah explains, is that the more one is immersed in Olam HaChomer, in the physical world, in materialism, then it will be very hard for him to become holy. Holiness is not compatible with tavot, with desires of physical things. So, since we are supposed to be a holy nation, and we want to grow spiritually, we have to rein in the physical desires. And that is why, in preparation of receiving the Torah, you see quite a few instructions that Moshe gives the Jewish people on how to purify themselves, how to keep a distance from the mountain. All of this is because preparation is important. You want to be holy, you need to prepare. You just can run into it, jump into it. Okay, I'm becoming holy now. As of tomorrow, I'm going to be holy. No, it requires effort, it requires work, it requires preparation. And we see that preparation right before they receive the Torah. They're instructed what to do to cleanse themselves, to purify themselves. Okay, but that was then. What will help us in the future to purify ourselves? Even though we've been talking about the key, yes, it's important to rein in the evil inclination to have that self-control in order that we become God-fearing Jews, yes. But what can help us along the way? 
Hashem does us a big favor. And that is, He gives us the Shabbat. Shabbat, such a beautiful day. I wish every day was Shabbat. Mm -hmm. It's a holy day. It's a blessed day. And that in itself tells you a lot. The fact that it's holy and it's blessed, it says a lot. It tells us that it's different than the rest of the physical week where we labor and labor and labor by the sweat of your brow, right? The Torah says that that's what we will do. Yes, but I gave you one day which is not cursed, one day which is actually blessed, a day that is holy, a day which is, resembles a little bit the world to come. That's Shabbat. And if you keep Shabbat properly, you will experience a very, very lofty feeling and the lofty feeling has to do with many things. It has to do with the number one, the Kedusha of that day, that you will actually feel the holiness. And that holiness, if you acquire it properly on Shabbat, will help remove you or release you from all that physical labor that you've had a whole week. Imagine the people that work on Shabbat. So they're asking to be cursed. Another day. Not enough that you have six days. You want us. Hashem gave you that seventh day, he gave you a gift that one day you don't have to work. Stay away therefore from all the forbidden functions on Shabbat because if you want to experience Shabbat properly, you have to treat it differently. You have to be respectful of it. Otherwise, you're not going to feel anything different than Shabbat. So Shabbat, besides having other things that it does for us, besides providing us with all kinds of other benefits, this in itself is a big benefit that it hopefully will be a tool in helping us sanctify ourselves. Okay, now we've reached a very important point. We now understand a little bit better where the weaknesses of man come from. Basically, it comes from his dependency on materialism, because he's half animal, he lives in the physical world, and therefore he's attracted to that which is physical, and because of that, he has a lot of trouble because of this materialism that Hashem has to help us in all kinds of ways to release us from that if we want to ever be holy. Materialism, which I also have a whole lecture about, what this has done to people. Incredible, terrible things happen to people because of their obsession with materialism. But that's life. That's human nature. and You cannot change that completely. You can control it, but not change it. One thing, however, is obvious. It makes it difficult to acquire Kedusha. It makes it difficult for a Jew to become holy if he's very obsessed, very attached to materialism. Because of that, because of that obsession, in the same Ten Commandments, the last one Hashem reveals to us is the key to make sure that you don't fall into the trap of materialism. What's that? Lo tachmod, don't covet. Interesting. Of all the commandments, Hashem decided, Lo tachmod will be in the Ten Commandments, and it will be the last one. The last one meaning so much depends on this one, because if you're not careful with this last one, and you covet, 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 this will cause potentially a chain reaction that may lead one to transgress the entire Torah. If you covet, you'll be jealous, You'll steal, you'll kill, you'll do all sorts of terrible things. You're going to be basically transgressing the entire Torah just because of that coveting. Now, you can't tell a person not to desire. We all have desires. The Torah doesn't use the word desire, lo It says lo tachmod. To covet is different than to desire. We desire certain things, but we don't make an issue from it. We don't bother people, sell this to me. I have to get my hands on this. Coveting is something that drives people crazy. So you understand what I mean by coveting? It's a very strong feeling of attachment to something that you must have. And if people do not control that lot achmod, this will be the cause of their undoing. Many great people throughout the entire history of mankind, great people have fallen because of this. They coveted a woman, they coveted power, they coveted money. Because of their coveting, they fell. They were so successful. They were married. They had children. They had a job. But this was their undoing. You don't have to look back in history. Every day in the news you hear about it. 
people who are at the top, whether it's politicians or the movie industry, being caught harming others for their own desire. Silly things. They thought they would never be caught. They'd get away with it. Look what has brought them down, not just from fame, but they're in jail because of that. And how much money they had to spend <laughs> in lawyers to defend their, uh, their name. Yes, Lo Tachmod, do not covet, has brought down a lot of people. Where did this all begin? Why is Lo Tachmod in the Ten Commandments? Not only because this is a fact that this will bring people down. This is really a problem for the very beginning of creation. If you look back to Adam and Chava, where did they fall? Through Tava, through desire. They were basically misled by the serpent, if you know the story. That whole story basically tells us this is the source of all the problems. How do we know it's the source? Just look back at the beginning of the Torah. The Torah makes, makes it a point to tell us about this incident to remind us this is what will cause man to fail. This is what will cause him to be disobedient of Hashem. To rebel against him on the first day? Yes, that's how powerful Tavot desires are. You can be knowledgeable, well-intended, with lots of money. You're okay, no? You can still fall because of Tavot. So if we don't control those desires with a commandment, it may not happen by itself. Why should a person control himself unless he's being commanded to do so? Hashem is telling you this is for your own good. I'm telling you, this can bring anyone down. The greatest of the greatest have fallen because of forbidden desires, too much coveting, addicted to these things. How do we know a person is in good shape spiritually? You know when we know he's in good shape? If he covets spirituality as much as he coveted materialism. Hopefully more. Hopefully more so. But if a Jew begins to covet to want, to be interested much more in spirituality than in materialism, then he's in good shape. He's in the right track. That shows that he cares about the right things, that he's in control. Otherwise, you have the opposite, people who are not in control. On the contrary, the evil inclination controls them. That's what addiction is. It's sad. But as I said earlier, Kedusha, holiness, Self-control does not come easy, and we see a remez, we see a hint of this in the parasha. There's some very interesting words in describing how Moshe approaches the mountain. Moshe nigashe la arafel. Moshe approaches the arafel. What's arafel? Arafel today is the translation of the word for fog. What exactly is this fog? Thick cloud, darkness. Why tell us that, that Moshe is approaching this darkness, this fog, this thick cloud? Obviously, there's distance between him and Hashem, but what is this telling us? At least what it is alluding to. It is alluding to that certain things are not clear to man. It's cloudy out there. Man does not have complete clarity of what's going on. He does not even know himself. He sometimes has to go to a psychologist to figure himself out. It's cloudy. Cloudy meaning is not everything is so clear to us. And as a result of this lack of clarity, we make mistakes. We don't always see the truth. We don't want the right things. On the contrary, we want the wrong things because of that lack of clarity. What therefore this is hinting to is that once we gain more clarity, about what our, our mission in life is, what we're supposed to do, what is right and what is wrong. Once we have more clarity, it will help us rein in the evil inclination and have better control. The reason, or part of the reason why people cannot control themselves is because of that lack of clarity. What is really important? What is a priority and what is not? What is right and what is wrong? Sometimes it's not so black and white, it's not so clear. They don't learn Torah, then they obviously have a disadvantage. They don't learn. But even if you learn, you might be biased. And if a person is biased, he doesn't see the truth. He only sees what he wants. That's what bias is. What interests, what interests him. Imagine bribing somebody with a half a million dollars. Not a hundred and not a thousand. A half a million. 
how many people would control themselves? And you know what a half a million dollars is? <laughs> they will start thinking, maybe there's a loophole in the Torah. <laughs> Sir, in the Torah there are no loopholes. No, but I remember I once learned that there are certain situations where you can be lenient. Really? <laughs> Why don't you ask somebody else? You don't be the judge. Because you might be biased over here. You want a real unbiased opinion about something? Ask somebody else who has no connection to this. And sometimes ask more than one person. Be very, very careful with bias. So in order to be able to better control ourselves, we have to have more clarity. Just to finish up, we're living in a generation of Mashiach, there's no doubt about it. As a result of that, can you imagine, today we have greater challenges and difficulties in staying upright, much more than our forefathers. And why is that? Because the Kabbalah teaches that many of the souls that will be reincarnated in this generation are reincarnated souls from the generation of the flood, from the Dora Palaga, from the generation that built that tower in Babel. There was souls that were very, very not good. Souls that committed many, many evils and corrupted themselves during their life back then. When these souls come back, they come back with, with similar tendencies because that is what they have to correct. Reincarnation is ultimately a chance to rectify. So you rectify with similar challenges, similar weaknesses, for the most part. And therefore we see strange things going on today. People acting in strange ways that you didn't see 35 years ago. Remember going to the beach in the 1950s or 60s? I mean, if you were you're old enough, if you remember those days, what was the bathing suit like of the woman? One piece. How come you know about this? You were looking, huh? <laughs> it was very different. Modesty. Modesty was something that was accepted everywhere. And today there's competition of who has the less, the less, the less, the less is better. Just one string. What is that? Where did this come from? So. We're not surprised because we were told that this will happen. But to be religious, to be God-fearing, to be strong, is much more difficult because we're exposed to all of this. So in this generation, what, what can we do to be able to always follow the truth? To follow the right path. What is it that we can do? I was thinking that there is an interesting verse that can be interpreted as follows. It says, Emet mi eretz titzmach. The truth will surge or grow from the ground. Interesting verse. So, based on that interpretation, that this is about the truth coming out from the ground, as though this is a plant, something that will grow out, how do we accomplish that? How do we get that truth to come out of the ground? One great rabbi said, the only way you can get truth to come out, to emerge, is if you first bury falsehood. You gotta bury that which is fake, that which is a lie. You gotta expose it. You gotta fight it. You bury that which is false, hopefully with Hashem you will have the emet coming out from it. So in the end, in order to do that, in order to want that, you have to make just one important decision. What's that decision? What's more important to you? What you want or what Hashem wants? Make that decision and you will be on the right path. Hopefully our decision will be that more than anything else we want what Hashem wants. Amen.